Hello, I'm Gary and this is episode 52 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today we're looking at buying an EV if you're a younger person. Before we start, I just wanted to see if you've subscribed to our newsletter. One goes out every week and it summarises the top EV stories of the week alongside a few little extras such as a non-EV renewable article that might get you to think a little bit and a link to something interesting you might want to buy. This week's newsletter is linked in the show notes. Please subscribe to get it in your inbox automatically. Our feature topic today concerns buying an EV as a younger person. A couple of weeks back we looked at second-hand EVs and Jonathan Porterfield from EcoCars made the following comment. Young, I feel for younger people because they desperately want to get into EVs, but there's not really much in the way of cheaper, newer electric cars. Very often the insurance on, say, a you know, £15,000 decent modern EV, the insurance for an 18-year-old is astronomical. When the episode went out, I posted this excerpt on Twitter and got connected with Harrison Hughes, who is Young EV Driver on Twitter. I thought it would be a good idea to have a quick chat with him and find out what specifically the issues were that affect young potential EV drivers. Say hello, Harrison. Hi there, I'm Harrison Hughes, known as Young EV Driver on YouTube and Twitter. Um, I'm on a mission to get as many young drivers or first-time drivers into EVs as uh, as many as possible, really. Uh, With the high insurance prices and the car prices, it seems to be a little bit difficult. So I just wanted to see how my journey goes. Excellent. Now, we first got connected because you were, as you've just mentioned, they're quite vocal about things like how expensive insurance is on uh, an EV for young people. So what what's your EV history at the moment? Well, um, the first time I saw a EV, well, known about an EV was the i3. I believe it was 2014. I was quite young then. Um, I've been passionate about them ever since. Uh, I've always been fascinated about them. And up until about three months ago, I bought my first EV, a Renault Zoe. I'm still currently 16, so not be able to drive it. But my parents are currently using it until I can, till I pass, which hopefully I can start taking my lessons on the 9th of July, when that's when I turn 17. And um, the parents, my parents have fallen in love with it. They're now looking at a Hyundai Ionic. And um, that's it, really. We just... I've always been fascinated about them. So I thought, why not go ahead and get it just before I pass so I can go straight ahead into an um, into an electric vehicle. That was basically it, really. We've all, the whole family love it. I'm just going to start learning on the 9th of July. Fall still goes ahead with the, you know, everything going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I just can't wait. I wanted to get straight into an EV. I'm very passionate about them. So I thought, why not? Why not go ahead and get straight into one? When I tweeted out this morning that I was chatting to you, we got a reply on that uh, that said, you know, the only barrier to young people owning an EV is the cost. What other problems are there? How, how do you respond to that sort of uh, a comment? To be honest, I yeah, exactly the cost. But the the cost of the cars, I'm not going. I'm not saying they're cheap, but they're not overpriced. For example, I paid like for just under 5,000 for my 2015 Renault Zoe. And compared to other, like the same year cars, I don't know, a Ford Focus, like a Modena, a newer Ford Focus, um, they're about the same price. But the main thing is the insurance. The insurance quotes were were quite a bit for the Renault Zoe. It was just under two grand for me, estimated. Ooh, how many insurance companies did you go to? I went to a... um, I know not the best way, but a compare like a comparison site, and that was the cheapest. It gets a lot cheaper. It gets a lot cheaper as I add additional drivers, so I could get it for about seventeen hundred if I add two additional drivers on there. But it still seems to be quite a lot. So like they have, we have the government grant to buy the new to buy new EVs and get your home charger installed. But if we want to get as many people into EVs as possible it's not going to be feasible for most young people. And these are the people who the EV should be marketed at, the younger people, because we're the future and who knows, are we all going to be driving? But if we are, hopefully it'll be an electric vehicle. Let's let's just loop back a second there, because 
On the subject of insurance companies, obviously you went through a, a comparison website. Were there any that you specifically looked at that were uh, companies like Plug Insure, for example, who spe- specialise in electric vehicles only? I did, yeah. I went to. A, I got some recommendations off Twitter and Facebook groups, and I believe Plug Insure wouldn't quote me, which is quite interesting because I was too young. I know a lot of them didn't quote me um, for a first time driver, seventeen. Uh, especially that that there's these insurance quotes with black boxes as that's the only way it could bring the price down a lot more. Mm-hmm. I did have a look around for just Pacific electric vehicle insurers and most of them didn't quote me, which I found really interesting because I thought, well, they know how these cars work and they should be, they should be targeting us really. They could get, get a good package, package deal. I mean, you said sort of 2000 was um, was about the price or down to 1700 But what, what was the maximum you were quoted for, you, Zoe? I didn't even go that far down the list, but it would have been near near three grand. And this is on a car with a purchase price of £5,000. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. That, and that's the, uh, the cheaper quotes were with a black box, which is still still quite a lot, I believe, for a black box. Yeah. I know it's probably difficult in the situation, but yeah, I mean, I have a nephew who's 18. He has a, um, his mother bought him a Ford car, KA. Uh, now, the car itself is dirt cheap, but again, the insurance is high purely because of his age. Now, I think the question I'm asking is, do you believe the premium is high purely because of your age or do you believe it's because it's an EV or what? I did a comparison video on my YouTube comparing a... Um, a Zoe compared to a, like an equally value car. Um, and I'm not saying it was cheap, but it was still quite expensive. But just because it's an electric vehicle, all of a sudden the prices go up by, I don't know, 400, 500 pounds um, compared to a, to compared to a nice car at my age. But I believe it's the wrong way around. As like, for example, my Zoe will only do around 70 miles on a charge. Mm-hmm. Um, so after 70 miles, I'm going to have to stop, have a break, recharge for a while um so i'm having a rest and the car's having a rest compared to if i was in a petrol ice car i could be driving i don't know 300 miles and i wouldn't have to stop which is more dangerous really compared to an electric vehicle so how much do you think the purchase price of the ev played into the premium um well on the insurance side yeah yeah too sure. I found a um, when I did the comparison. I can't remember what car I compared it to, but it was around the same price as my used Zoe, and there was about a five six hundred pounds difference, both with black boxes compared to the Zoe, which mm. is still is still quite a quite a big difference just because it's an electric car. And it was the that I mean that was the same price car used that I put in about six grand five grand. Did you consider other EVs other than the Zoe? I was stuck between a Leaf and a Zoe. I mean, they're the only ones in my price range apart from, you know, the iMeve and the Citroen C0, but I wasn't a mm. big fan on the looks. But the Leaf turned out to be a lot more expensive to insure compared to the Zoe. It was around £300 more just for the Leaf. Um, so I thought, well, the Zoe's going to cost not as much to buy. Obviously, you have the battery lease, but... To be honest, I preferred the look of the Zoe and I thought, do you know what, why not? The value's only going up on Zoe's. So I thought I'll go ahead yeah. with it. And especially yeah. with the cheaper insurance. I gotta say I love the looks of the um the Zoe. I think it's a very stylish looking car. Especially for a car that came out in, you know, 2012, 13, it still looks like it belongs on the roads today. And even the brand new version, the uh, Zoe 50, they haven't changed the looks, the exterior that radically. So, uh, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know? Exactly. Um, I don't know whether you've heard of Ewan McTurk. I'm not sure. No, I don't think I have. Ewan McTurk, is, um, he's big in the battery world, um, EV batteries specifically. He's had electric cars for 15, 20 years. Um, but he has a YouTube channel called Plug Life Television. And one of the recent videos that he did um he basically went through and compared the price of a i forget how much it was it was probably around a six thousand pounds ev with a ford focus that cost 140 pounds which was the cheapest runnable vehicle he could find 
on auto trader and he did the calculations and worked out that even if you were paying a loan on the ev the savings that you were making on the running costs meant that it was actually cheaper to buy the six thousand pounds ev than it was to buy the 140 pounds yeah. ford focus so given that there's that sort of differential between a fossil fuel car and an ev has any of that played into sort of the calculations that you've done in terms of the insurance premium that you've uh, you've ended up paying yeah well the main thing um to be honest was the value of the cars i mean three years ago two three years ago you could get a zoe for around three thousand pounds and now they're going for what six seven thousand pounds so that's what played on my mind the most that the value is only going up on these cars as the as the demand is Mm -hmm. more people want them so why not go ahead and buy a car that i could possibly i'm not saying i would but possibly make a bit of money on or lose barely any but especially the EV, the savings and especially parking as well. I mean, if I was to drive into college, um, parking in a normal car would cost me around £11 a day. And just around the corner, there's a free charger, which you get free parking. So if I'm driving in every other day, I could charge and park for free. And that was just one of the massive, massive differences that I thought, well, why would I want to, why would I want to go for an ICE car? That brings up an interesting cause, uh, point because one of my questions down here was, w- what is your actual vehicle charging situation? Um, I mean, you've obviously talked about the just then about the charges at college. Do you have home charging? Are there nearby rapids, for example? Well, um, we have only just got our home charger installed, our pod point on the driveway. Um, so before that, for the last two or three months, uh, we've been using the electric blue lamppost chargers on the street. We have one just outside our house Mm -hmm. and um, they've been free ever since they got put in. So we've had, I don't know, however many hundred or a thousand miles for nothing just by charging up there. But in Brighton, I'm quite lucky that we have these lamppost chargers literally everywhere. You're never more than a mile from a lamppost charger. Um, But now we have our home charger on the on the on the house um it just makes everything a lot easier uh, but charging isn't really an issue for us even if we could live without having a home charger easily uh, yes it's i know that's one of the big um sort of barriers that a lot of people who are hesitant about evs they go oh, well you know I, I park on the street i can't find anywhere to to plug in and at the end of the day it can be an inconvenience but simon who was the uh, founded this podcast with me. He had a, still has a BMW i3, um, lives in a block of flats, doesn't have home charging. And he said, it's not an issue. He does exactly what you were saying there. He goes out, he finds places nearby. There's a, a Waitrose just around the corner for him from him with a seven kilowatt charger. So he can go there and park it up for a couple of hours and never has a problem. Um, I know I've been now to Brian several times is there's a little bit of a lack of rapid charges uh absolutely a bit of an issue um but hopefully the local council are starting to uh look at addressing that um because it is a bit of a a charging wasteland when it comes to anything above about 22 kilowatts isn't it that is the main problem in the nearest rapid charger that actually works here is in just about just in shoreham on a shell garage so it's not really ideal to wanting to be go over there every time you need to recharge. Um, but I have spoke to someone at the council who is managing the EV infrastructure and they are putting in four rapid hubs around Brighton over the next year, um, which can initially be used for everybody. But then as the demand for tax electric taxis get picked up, apparently they're going to be for taxis only. So I'm not sure what's going to happen for about the public, public side of rapid charging but hopefully hopefully we get something that uh, that's happy for everybody you know just even, we just need a couple of hubs in the city really i think the good thing about charging and we've said it on the podcast several times is that the the charging situation is never going to be as bad as it is today every day it gets better and i mean you've just talked about several examples there and there are companies like uh, ingenie and instavolt who are polar as well who are expanding all across the country now they have their own sort of algorithms regarding where they'll put 
the rapid charges on whether they'll put you know a fast in here as well or or just stick with the 50 kilowatt ones but you know i've spoke to a lot of the people who work at those organizations and their aim is to get as many chargers in as many places as quickly as possible so it will come it just may not be as quick as we all like we could do with them but now we have all these lamppost chargers these have only come around really in this last year before if we didn't have the lamppost chargers I, if i'm honest i would say I wouldn't recommend having an EV in the Brighton area. But now I could say to anybody confidently, go ahead, get one, because you're never, ever far from a lamppost charger. And especially, like you said, that every day there's no, there's new infrastructure. If I open ZapMap, I'll see a new charger on a different street, literally around the corner, around the corner mm-hmm. from me. Um, it's just growing every day. It's crazy, the, the growth rate. Yeah, I totally agree. You, no argument from me on that. So let's let's kind of just loop back round to where we started before we uh, before we sort of finish up here, which is at the moment you have the Zoe. You're not authorised to drive it because you're a bit too young, but presumably family members are driving it on your behalf. Absolutely, yeah. And you have are you on their insurance or have you actually gone and got your own insurance now? Well, because I'm still 16, so um, I can't get any insurance at the moment. I'm not driving it at all. Uh, but when I do go and get out, when I do turn 17 and get my insurance, um, I will have a shop around and see if it's cheaper to go onto their insurance. But what I've looked at, it seems to be cheaper to get my own insurance and get them on, get my parents on as additional drivers. So um, I'll have a look at, I'll have a look at that when we get round to being 17, really. So from the discussions that we've had earlier, you're anticipating somewhere in the region of £1,700 a year as a premium. That's a lot of money for a young person, isn't it? It is a lot of money. And I'm not saying that um, because I have a friend who has a used mini, it's worth around, I don't know, £3,000. He's 17 as well. And his insurance was still quite a bit. But he paid about, I don't know, Four hundred pounds less, just because he's in a ice car, and I mean it's not a slow car. The mini he's got, mm. and it's, I just don't see why that EVs are more expensive. I understand that if there was an accident and the battery and stuff like that, but we're driving for a lot less time. You're going to have a rest when you need to charge up, etc. So I don't see why they need to be more expensive. I know you're not going to like hearing this, but the first car I ever bought was a Porsche nine eleven. And I was, yeah, I was about 30 when it happened, but my insurance premium then, even at 30 for on a, a Porsche was about 900 pounds. So it's, it's definitely going to get better for you as you get older. Don't worry. I mean, I'm following somebody on Twitter and I can't remember his name off the top of my head. He got his first EV, I believe when he was either 18 or 19, it was a leaf mm-hmm. and he still paid quite a bit he paid I think just under two grand so at least I see the prices are starting to come down as more insurance companies are aware of electric vehicles and how they work and the batteries inside them but yeah yeah, it's interesting yeah so what advice would you give to young drivers wanting to get into EVs definitely like you said work out the savings from anything from parking road tax anything like that don't just automatically think of the petrol because i'm going to make the biggest savings most likely in my parking it is going to i mean if i had a nice car i wouldn't be able to drive into college just because of the cost of parking it is it's unbelievable in central brighton because there's a free charger with free parking i can park there for for nothing so you're saying it's basically it's a total cost of ownership it's not just yeah the initial the initial price it is you're going to look at it compared to a I just can't think, oh, well, I can't afford that. It's going to be a lot more. But if you could, if you could I don't know, stretch stretch your budget a little bit more, you'll make a lot of your money back. And it'll, it could end up working out to the same as an ice car. And then if you've got the added benefit of being able to sell your EV on after a few years yeah. for the same or even slightly more, then, you know, that's just the icing on the cake, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, every day you see these Zoe prices going up and up and up, and it just makes you think, why, why would you own yeah. anything else? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what Jonathan Porterfield said a couple of weeks ago when we first brought up this subject, because it was him who basically said, uh, you know, the prices are increasing, but young people are being priced out, not necessarily from the the purchase price, but from the insurance. And that's how we got onto this whole 
topic of insurance for young people, which is how you and I sort of got in touch on that. So, yeah, your experience matches up exactly with, uh, you know, Jonathan, who sells secondhand cars for a living, secondhand EVs for a living. So, yeah. Uh, Harrison, thank you very much for your time. I don't have any more questions. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Any any additional topic you'd like to bring up before we go? Topic really, just getting as many people into electric vehicles and they need to be targeted. The younger people, they need to have a, a way they can get into these vehicles. I don't know, either a vehicle package with a lease and your insurance included. Um, but hopefully a lot of interesting stuff is going to come around and uh, I can't wait for the, the future for EVs, really. I think that's a perfect place to end it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. It should be said, of course, that one factor which plays into insurance premiums is the insurance group. A Renault Zoe is in the insurance group 18 or higher, whereas a Mini, for example, would be an in insurance group 12 or 13 for a similarly priced vehicle. This is mainly due to the fact that EVs have higher acceleration rates than comparabilized vehicles, and this affects their risk. The one thing that came from my discussion with Harrison is that he's thinking total cost of ownership rather than fixating on individual items such as purchase price or insurance cost. As Jonathan Portfield mentioned two weeks ago, second-hand EVs are appreciating in value, which means Harrison will earn back his money when he sells the Zoe. He's also looking at this from the point of view of how much money he can save by charging at university rather than having to pay for parking. This is absolutely the right attitude and my thanks to Harrison for his time. It's time to share a cool renewable or EV thing with you listeners. Charge company Instavolt have announced recently that they're partnering with McDonald's to provide rapid chargers at their drive through facilities in the UK. The announcement was made in the middle of last week, and we like this here on the podcast. Instavolt are looking at putting in their 125 kilowatt rapid chargers at the various sites. Although remember, they aren't actually 125 kilowatt chargers, they're twin 62 and a half kilowatt chargers, which are daisy chained together to provide the power. We're always happy to see more chargers being installed, but we would like to know a little bit more detail about this. How many drive through facilities are owned by McDonald's that have the underlying space and infrastructure to support rapid chargers, for example? Nevertheless, more chargers is always a good thing. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, use the EV Musings Twitter account, Musings EV. If you want an equipped reference ebook to read on your Kindle, I wrote a little something called So You've Gone Electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent. But at the moment, it's free on Kindle Unlimited or if you're in the Kindle Lending Library. Check it out. It's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. Links for everything I've talked about in the podcast today are in the description in the show notes. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise our visibility and extend our reach in search engines. Thanks as always to my co-founder, Simon. You know, he was driving home a few weeks back when he saw an ice cream van at the side of the road. Of course, he had to stop and grab a 99 before it turned off down the side street. So I thought, why not go ahead and get it just before I pass so I can go straight ahead. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.